Hi, Herbalists. I'm Heather Irvine, and I'm a frequent contributor to the Herb Rally podcast. I learned at the Northeast School of Botanical Medicine and the Vermont Center for Integrative Herbalism. I have worked in a naturopathic clinic. I've had my own clinical practice, and for 10 years, I had a simple herbal product-based business that was profitable for me. I now teach herbalism in many capacities, and one of the things I've started is a SoundWise publisher page that's entirely audio lessons about herbalism. You can search for a particular plant or topic. You can learn. You can refresh before you see a client or before you give a talk. Um, It's something that I would have liked to have had for a really long time. So it's brand new. I'm just getting started. I'm adding to it pretty much every day, and I'm just going to debut um, a kind of a short version of what you might find there. Mason is going to have the link for you right now. Almost all the content I have there is free. Um, That could change. Some is for fee. Um, But this is an example. This is going to be the shortest one I have done, and this is on myrrh. I selected myrrh basically because... I've got a tooth and gum health track um, or sound cast of several tracks, uh, and this can add to that. Most of the plant monographs so far are around a half an hour to even 40 minutes. I suspect this one might be more like, uh, more like 5 or 10. So here we go with myrrh. Comifora molmol is a really excellent plant to know for tooth and gum and mouth and throat health. So I'm not going to go into every single thing about myrrh here. There will be an expanded myrrh monograph at some point, Um, but I really do love this plant for upper respiratory issues and also uh, for the teeth and gums. So um, of course this is a resin that comes from a tree. We're talking an African, North African and Middle Eastern Um, arid climate plant um, and somewhat slow growing and you know this isn't this possibly isn't the most sustainable of ingredients you want to use it judiciously but also when it is called for a small amount can really do wonders so maybe you already have some and you don't know how to use it Um, or maybe you just kind of want to know this plant in your repertoire and I would expand a lot of what, what I'll say about myrrh Um, to other tree resins and resinous plants in general. So the myrrh tree sometimes exudes its resin naturally um, in sort of light yellow, um, sort of crystalline um, hardened globs. And sometimes it's harvested from the tree by scoring the tree. The resin exudes from the tree, it's collected, it dries, and it hardens. A thing about myrrh is once it's harvested, in contrast to some other plant remedies, um, the resin is going to last a really long time and have a good quality for a really long time. And also super small amounts can be really useful. So imagine a kind of stout, kind of scraggly tree with pointy branches. And interestingly, this is in the a family of trees that is also called elephant trunks. It's the Berseraceae family. The resins of this family of trees are often bitter and aromatic, often medicinal. They also tend to have a kind of drying and astringent nature to them, but also in just in, by physical property of being resins, if you can get contact with the gums, the throat, and so on, or topically, Um, it can make a really good protective layer. And also, plant resins, and particularly, uh, you know, tree resins that we know in herbalism, are super antiseptic and also anti-inflammatory. And by antiseptic, I mean it makes the physical quality of that tissue a little bit less permeable and a little bit less hospitable to pathogens like bacteria. But we also see a wide spectrum of actually antimicrobial um, action against bacterium, bacterium, bacteria, um, pathogenic, you know, yeast and fungi, um, 
perhaps, you know, antiviral as well. With that astringent action and that anti, kind of anti-inflammatory and antimicrobial action, um, we also see that, you know, resins like myrrh tend to, or we think, um, encourage a little bit of circulation around an area too. And so, you know, it may be part of its anti-inflammatory action that it is um, improving circulation in an area a little bit, um, therefore helping to resolve sort of the cycle of inflammatory compounds the body generates, which then generate more of those and other compounds that keep the inflammation cycle going. Um, but we also see some, you know, some specific anti-inflammatory actions and many um, within, you know, tree resins and myrrh specifically. Now that seems like a lot of positives going for this plant, but it's also said to be immune stimulant. Now, in conventional medicine, I don't know that you often see immune stimulant and anti-inflammatory together, but we have with uh, medicinal plants uh, a lot of substances that have both a myriad of compounds and also a little bit more kind of nuanced interaction with the body or the body is able to respond to them in a way that is a little bit more favorable with respect to um, not being so unidirectional in, um, you know, just driving inflammation and, and immune response, um, but often sort of having the, the kind of response we would want to see. Little bit easing back on some of the uncomfortable stuff of inflammation, like the, you know, redness and swelling and loss of function, and a little bit of just gentle support and reminders to certain aspects of the immune system. So let's talk about what's going on in myrrh with constituents. Um, I'm going to keep this one pretty simple, but I think that might be easier to hear, understand, remember for the time being. So we have volatile oils that's part of it and just part of it and you'll see some of the ones that are most commonly kind of um, talked about are limonene also occurs in lemons and a lot of other aromatic plants pinene occurs in pine and a lot of other aromatic and resinous plants um, eugenol uh, famously in clove and many other aromatic kind of oils substances spices etc remedies a step up in complexity from and sort of lasting power from volatile oils are uh, resins, basically. They have some similarities to the volatile oils, but they're a little bit bigger constituent and they last a little bit longer um, and, so, and have sticky qualities and stick to the tissue. Um, so in myrrh, um, there are many, many different resins. And if we're talking about individual constituents, they're often called comophoric acids or the genus of myrrh. Um, but I want to make a little distinction about resins is we have certain like individual constituents that are called resins. Um, but the resin is also a word for sort of a conglomeration of constituents that often occur together. They could be, you know, very similar in structure, and they're not often isolated, um, you know, by sort of conventional chemistry means or even or natural you know or sort of traditional preparation means um, or it could refer to both some of these resin true resin compounds plus waxes oils minerals other things that just tend to occur in that sticky and solid substance um, you know that aren't easy to separate uh, and so we call that sort of mixture a resin as well that's the definition of resin you kind of already know or intuit. As we go up in complexity, some are called furano sesquiterpenes. Keep that term in mind if it interests you. <laughs> okay, so in herbalism, we sometimes talk about specific indications. These are things that are kind of um, specific uses kind of inherited through, um, you know, medicinal plant and herbal culture and also, you know, even expanded on to present day. So, some specific indications for myrrh uh, include mucous membrane inflammation with ulceration. So let's imagine, um, you know, tissue that is not uh, entire or that is uh, irritated or that's uh, swollen or compromised. This can be with or without infection or, you know, with or without infection as a cause or um, concurrent with it. 
Um, and it's used for tissue that is red, inflamed, infected. Um, thinking about a lot of mouth problems here, like gingivitis, perid periodontal disease, and some of the ways that I have really loved myrrh, because I do really reserve it for when really needed. Um, strep throat, sore throat. Of course, if you have strep throat, if anyone has strep throat, um, they need a proper assessment and they could likely need antibiotics. But sometimes the um, care that is medically recommended is or includes at-home care. So this could be included as an adjuvant as at-home care. Now, if you think of ulcerations of the mouth, um, we also sometimes use myrrh for um, sort of ulcerations, uh, redness, inflamed tissue of the skin, especially where it is sort of, um, you know, wet and weak in nature. So bed sores are an example. Um, bed sores are an example where myrrh can be a little bit drying, can be a little bit um, circulation increasing, um, generally isn't especially pain increasing, um, you know, and just the astringency and drying nature can have a little bit of a, and, and the protective nature, um, while still being somewhat breathable or, or thin, um, you know, makes a thin layer can be a good, can be a good match. So it can be painted on the skin in, you know, liquid extracts, um, can also be used in mouthwashes, um. Now it takes a bit to sort of dilute and dissolve myrrh. You're probably going to have to use an alcohol solution to get it dissolved. You're probably going to have to use some water to make it not quite as grating um, on these irritated tissues. Some herbalists suggest adding some demulcents after um, or other antiseptic herbs, um, but you're probably gonna have to mix and shake any kind of solution with uh, myrrh resin. Um, you know, before use uh, and, and have some patience with it. Now I have mostly used it with the common sort of tooth and mouth issues like, you know, wisdom tooth is coming in, someone has had an oral surgery and they're looking for some at home sort of first aid to reduce possibility of infection. Um, maybe they have some sort of throat issues that are sometimes related to mouth health. I'm thinking about tonsil stones or really irritated, difficult to beat um, sore throat. It would also be a really great component of a lozenge or a throat spray, really good application, um, a throat spray. Of course, it may glom up the sprayer a little bit, but usually some warm water as well as combining it with other ingredients can overcome that. But it's also used, remember, with, um, you know, after inflammation or with inflammation to help kind of overstaying inflammation resolve. And it's a little bit circulatory stimulating, a little, little bit. Um, not anything that I think would be concerning for adverse events. Um, but because of these two actions, it's used to just uh, kind of dispel congealed blood. It, you can think of it for bruises, boils, um, swollen areas, um, you know, anything of that nature, topically, um, and perhaps a, a small amounts internally too. In large doses, we do think it has slight, slight, um, slight, slight effects on circulation and the heartbeat. Not anything outrageous, um, but just a, you know, a little bit of a stimulant kind of action. Still going to be less than coffee and a lot of things that people are used to every day. Just a slight, slight whisper of an effect. For um, most preparations, I tend to make a super high alcohol, high percent alcohol extract because that is the way you can dissolve it. I did mention, you know, possibly diluting it for certain applications to be a little bit kinder, um, but you might keep just the stock bottle of it as a high percent alcohol extract. For the tooth, for the teeth and mouth, it can be used just frequently as a mouthwash or applied directly to an affected area. Uh, for internal use, 10 to 30 drops um, several times a day. Okay for most. Um, if someone is not eating a lot of food because of their illness, then it could be a little uneasy on the stomach. 
um, you know, in absence of food, but uh, that's not suggestive of, an, of really like a, you know, toxicity or adverse event. It's just we're not used to ingesting resins all the time. On that note, if you make a decoction, some sources suggest 3 to 12 grams per day, but I think as a decoction that might be a little bit abrasive on the stomach, so I just go for small, small amounts and in small, small amounts of water so that someone could, you know, if you are going with a, de a decoction, so that someone can stomach it okay. And I might add some carminative, stomach relaxing or stomach aiding herbs um, if if you are going that route of a decoction or water extract to be ingested. In other words, a strong tea used in small amounts. Now let's talk about a few more specific uses. Um, it has been used with um, licorice and with other herbs for canker sores. We're thinking antiviral here and also protective. Um, it has been used uh, with corydalis and or frankincense uh, for painful swollen joints. It has been used as an anti-helminthic, so an anti-helminthic, so that is, um, you know, for intestinal or uh, for parasite worms. Um, I don't suggest this alone. I suggest, you know, professional assessment and treatment. Um, but there are some, there's definite, tr definite traditional use and also um, some, you know, small clinical trials as well. Small as in like several hundreds of people per trial. And then there's one more really big use that is not like all these others that I've talked about that I've been amazed to have seen um, in clients. Uh, so that's pretty cool. So while working with a naturopathic doctor for several years, working alongside her, I uh, learned or I had learned, you know, of its use prior in herb school um, for reducing cholesterol, but I guess I maybe always took that with a grain of salt, okay, as a hopefulness or, you know, there were some clinical trials, but would this be, you know, substantial, uh, maybe in a person who wasn't in a really controlled clinical trial or something. So part of the constituent profile of this plant are sterols. And these are constituents that are molecularly and chemically, you know, shape-wise, somewhat similar to cholesterol. They have a similar backbone of the cholesterol molecule, and then a little bit more other functional groups, you know, other OH groups, uh, you know, just they're sort of a variation of cholesterol that doesn't have the same function in the body as cholesterol, certainly not but it can be picked up on or can be recognized kind of by some receptors um, that are doing regulation. And so it seems as if, um, you know, the presence of certain sterols taken, you know, in plant form or sterols from certain plants can adjust or affect temporarily, you know, while you're ingesting the plant um, or for that, you know, few days, our metabolism of cholesterol, whether or not we're absorbing certain cholesterols um, and how we are, you know, making our own cholesterol um, and what forms and, you know, what the body is doing with it. So this is pretty remarkable. Um, and we see this to an even greater extent with the herb called Google um, and with a few others, but we do see some indication, traditional use, and definitely um, some, you know, clinical trial type, you know, studies and other types of models that suggest that for some, um, myrrh may do this to a degree as well, may influence a sort of more positive lipid profile. You know, we're talking about a potential slight, slight cholesterol lowering mechanism. We also might see a slight increase in the breakdown of fibrin, um, you know, related to platelet aggregation. So if someone is concerned both about uh, blood lipid profile and perhaps, um, you know, blood coagulation, um, you know, blood are looking for a slight blood thinning, there is some potential there, maybe just a little whisper. Um, this isn't, I would say, to, you know, be going off of medications, but it's um, a potential helper for someone who's doing some 
perhaps maintenance. That said, that often comes with the flip side warning of, you know, it could be blood thinning, don't use before surgery, don't use with blood thinners. And so definitely be cautious of all of those things as well. So to summarize, ways that I have used myrrh are um, for tooth and gum issues. Let's say someone is, you know, has their dentist appointment because they have a sore tooth, they have had an oral surgery, they have a wisdom tooth coming in that sort of thing. Um, this may help to slightly reduce the sort of pathways and possibilities of infection or just keep that at bay while they wait for their, you know, their dental appointment. Um, this can also be useful for issues of the, you know, kind of common issues of the throat, like really um, raw, ragged, sore throat, um, lasting either very acute or lasting longer than is uh, desired and usual. Um, and that's a way that I have used it personally when I had a lot of exposure to germs in a very dry, cold climate too. Some use it for cold sores. Um, some use it for other sorts of sores uh, on the skin, especially when they're a little bit raw, wet, weepy. Um, and if there's a, any kind of sort of pathogenic type of nature to them, you know, you want to get a professional assessment and treatment as well. But if you're told to take care of it, you know, with home remedies or at home, this might be a helper. And then we see a very interesting, um, well, we see some interesting anti-inflammatory uses for things like arthritis. I'm not sure if I really mentioned that to great depth, um, but that is there. And then we have a very amazing slight um, kind of influence on cholesterol being a little bit possibly slightly, slightly cholesterol reducing. Now, when I have seen that work for someone, um, you know, work for people in clinic, it was, you know, we tried this when they were doing all the other things you do, um, you know, diet, lifestyle, etc., um, to improve a lipid profile or reduce cholesterol. Um, and so this, you know, that's a caveat, but it's also a true caveat. Okay, so I hope that maybe you learned a little bit or reviewed a little bit about myrrh. Um, I would love it if you check out my publisher page on the SoundWise app. Mason will have the link for you in the um, kind of written intro or associated text. I have a chat like this about spilanthes and about propolis as well in the tooth and mouth and gum health section of my publisher page. And I'm adding to that little page just about every day. So I'll probably be on here again to remind you. Thanks so much. Um, hope to connect with you again. Oh, and just one thing. If you're already using the SoundWise app or you're going to, my publisher page is called Soundwise About Medicinal Plants. All right, toodles, everyone.